Some people sure love speech. Good speech. Bad speech. Whatever the fuck this guy's doing. Regardless, all ideas should be welcomed into the public square, right? Hey there. Disembodied voice back again. Now, it's a common belief that Silicon Valley has been overrun by snooty, burrito-eating millennials who can't keep their greasy fingers off the censor button and silence ideas they disagree with. I'll just cut to the chase. Big tech's out to get conservatives. That's not a suspicion. That's not a hunch. That's a fact. So here's a video essay to set the record straight. Is big tech engaged in censorship? Are they promoting a leftist agenda? Have free speech alternatives thrived in place of mainstream platforms? This is a video to examine everything about the free speech debate on big tech and everything it might miss. Wait, why did you put free speech in qua? Let's go back to January 6th, 2021, when insurrectionists, to some, peaceful demonstrators to others, stormed the United States Capitol building in an attempt to decertify the election of Joe Biden and, well, take a fat dump on democracy. At that point, the world's major social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter, had seen enough and banned the instigator Donald Trump effectively stripping away one of the largest megaphones a person could ever wield basically in human history. He would be banned for two years from Facebook and permanently from Twitter. To many, this was a shot heard around the world, clear proof that social media was finally doing what they had always wanted to do, to begin censoring ideas rather than the usual illegal stuff we're used to seeing them censor. Fast forward to May, 2022, Silicon Valley tycoon and CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, Elon Musk, declared that he himself had seen enough. So concerned about free speech and preserving the public square, he announced plans to own Twitter outright and write his own rules. As of the time of this video, Musk admits to shooting his wad prematurely, shooting his wad prematurely on the deal, claiming to be misled about the amount of spam and bot activity present on the platform. But I'm not interested in the corporate future of Twitter as much as I'm interested in Musk's stated motivations, which sound like it made a whole lot of sense to a lot of people. After all, freedom of speech is a foundation of a free and democratic society, that in order to promote the good, we have to tolerate the bad and resist the rather authoritarian impulse to decide which is which. Should we really have the gall to determine winners and losers in the free marketplace of ideas? And thus, space governed by big tech would be wrested from the clutches of the censorship-loving, freedom-hating, lefty nutsacks of Silicon Valley. And given back to the masses, free speech will reign once again. But what if I told you the world doesn't work that way at all? That the concept of free speech actually doesn't work that way, that tech platforms don't work that way, that the internet doesn't work that way? You would then see this story for what it is, a self-serving delusion, a billionaire's fantasy, if you will. <laughs> okay, on with the video. On the big tech stuff, you know, I-, I These Silicon Valley tyrants are also attacking our democracy itself. Big tech has gone too far. Way too long. Chapter one. Can we just pause for a second? Just what the f is free speech anyways? Go ahead, define it. I'll wait. It's the right to express what I want without fear of oppression. Great, let's do a little exercise. Look around your room, Turn to an object, let's say your anime pillow, and communicate the most obscene, perverted thing you can think of to that pillow. Congrats, baby. By your definition, you have just exercised your right to free speech. Wait a minute. It's not free speech unless I'm in the presence of others to hear my message. And I don't own an anime pillow. Point taken. You need an audience. Now try this. Think of a message you'd like to say, rent a truck, a loudspeaker, and blast that message at 4 a.m. down your neighborhood street. 
Congrats, baby. You just exercised your right to free... Wait a minute. That's against the law. Oh my god. I didn't know free speech was illegal. Well, yes. No? Okay, okay. The point I'm making is speech is kind of complicated. It's not just something you have or you don't. And this is something that, quote, free speech absolutists, like Papa Bear here, will never understand. In order for speech to be speech, you need context. Otherwise, most of what you have to say are nothing but meaningless sound utterances bouncing off the slimy membranes inside your face hole, like this. Or like this. And so, your ability to abstractly represent the world and then to generate avatars that can be defeated without you dying is dependent on your incorporation of a multitude of opinions. And that in itself is a consequence of, I mean, that works to the degree that communication. Instead, your speech has to be situated in some environment of consequences if it is to have any meaning. And it's for this exact reason that, brace yourself, there really is no such thing as free speech. We as humans are forced to share space either in public or online, and therefore our thoughts and ideas are restricted by circumstance. Limitations on time, manner, place, cultural norms, what have you. And that if you want an audience, if you want an environment of consequence, you're going to have to deal with restrictions. Case in point, a cherished free speech practice is public comment, aka the ability to communicate with elected officials in the open. Usually the entire building doesn't just erupt in simultaneous shouting. Instead, it's done in an orderly manner with rules and restrictions about what can be said, where, when, and how. We instate him as an honorary cloud commission. The Clowning Society of America stands with you, Mr. Wheeler. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. If you want to speak, you have to wait your turn. If you're disruptive, by, say, mm, publicly threatening others, I can and I will have you shot. You're actually ruining the environment of free expression, and everyone would feel in the right to, well, kick your ass out. Law scholar Stanley Fish puts it this way. As long as there is something at stake, as long as speech is more than noise indifferently produced, there's no such thing as free, that is, completely unfettered, speech. Speech is always attached and tied down to the pre-known situational context of utterance, and it is only because speech is attached and tied down that it has significance. Fish argues that when we fight for free speech, per se, we aren't actually fighting for the right to make speech. It's not about speech for speech's sake. Rather, we are actually fighting for the values associated with speech, like the search for truth, the ability to be an informed citizenry, and allowing dissent against entrenched authority. Lying, for example, is technically speech, but more lying does not mean freer speech, quite the opposite, Lying frustrates our ability to seek truth and be informed. And it's the reason most of us are okay with criminal penalties for doing it while under oath. In other words, free speech is also a matter of quality rather than just quantity. Therefore, it will always be tied down with restrictions. Hold on. Do you mean sense... <clears throat> sense... Sense her, you can do this. Hey, remember SAT word analogies? This may surprise you, but fundamentally, censorship is actually not the opposite of free speech. Tell them what they've won. Why? It's a quote from philosopher and gender theorist Judith Butler. In an essay entitled, Ruled Out, Vocabularies of the Censor, Butler writes, no speech is permissible without some other speech becoming impermissible. Censorship is what permits speech to have sense. In order for speech to be remotely comprehensible, you have to separate the signal from the noise. Thus, it's possible that there can be too much speech 
which can undermine the entire purpose of the medium you established. And this is especially true for online spaces. Don't believe me? The following is a list of ways that censorship is accepted by most people. Compromising individual privacy, doxing, unsolicited advertising, gore and violence, harassment and direct threats, spam, nudity, graphic sex, child sexual abuse material, slurs and profanity, incitement to violence, inauthentic behavior and impersonation, speech, integral to criminal conduct, classified national security matters, copyright trademark infringement, disclosing company information and trade secrets, terrorist recruitment content. Let's talk about spam. And no, I don't mean Masubis. I'm talking about the bad kind. Name absolutely any platform, from Facebook to Truth Social to 4chan. They all have one thing in common. They hate spam. What is spam anyways? Most people think of spam as unwanted email advertising or getting scammed by fake African royalty, a practice which is actually regulated by law. But here, I'm talking about spam more generally, as content which takes many forms and exists on many platforms. And it's defined as low quality information that is boosted through manufactured or deceptive tactics. YouTube gets an estimated 720,000 hours of video uploaded each day, meaning it would take your entire lifetime without sleeping to watch content uploaded in a single day. Good Lord. I mean, how many times can you be oddly satisfied? In first quarter of 2022, YouTube removed around 4.4 million YouTube channels. Of that number, guess how many were due to spam? Psych, you thought the color meant the thing. Over 90% of removals were due to spam. An average user doesn't realize how massive a problem spam is. And that is one thing I'll credit to big tech. They've actually done a fairly good job of suppressing it to the point where it goes mostly unnoticed. Speak to any professional who has worked behind the curtain, spam absolutely ruins any platform. That is why they enlist armies of disgustingly overpaid data scientists and engineers, as well as armies of disgustingly underpaid reviewers who might get fired for going to the bathroom, all to do what? To promote a leftist agenda? <laughs> Don't be thick. According to Google's 2020 web spam report, Google detected 40 billion spammy pages each day. 40% of pages that we crawled in the last year in Europe were spam pages. This is a war that we're fighting. Remember that spam is still content. So if you're a European, that means Google suppressed 40 freaking percent of the internet for you. And no one battered an eyelash? I mean, ein eyelash? Because it's Europe? Well, you might say, well, of course they have to censor spam. <laughs> and to that I ask, why? No, really, why? I'll be more specific. Why isn't spam free speech? And if it is, why aren't you rushing to defend it? Low quality content is unpleasant, but it's not illegal. Content may be deceptive, but it may not always be harmful. Spammy content is optimized for maximum engagement, usually for monetization. But hell, that's starting to sound like a lot of content on the internet. It is not entirely irrelevant to users either. I mean, who doesn't want to last longer in bed with one simple trick? And this is, after all, the public square. Why should we trust our big tech overlords to decide what content is and isn't spam? Shouldn't people be free to determine themselves if they don't want it? What say you, free speech absolutists? That's why all these blowhards opining over the public square have no f***ing idea what they are talking about. At a basic level, there are a million and one reasons why a physical square is a shite metaphor for the internet. But gah, I wish I could just demonstrate why. Maybe in the form of a poorly drawn cartoon. Ah, a beautiful day in the public square. Hear ye, hear ye, diaper rash is a lie sold to you by globalist diaper financiers. Oh, oh stand down, thought police. This is the public square. All speech is protected here, so run along. Ha ha, should my ideas be wrong, may they be openly challenged in the public square. Dick pills. 
unfortunate. Alas, tis the price we pay for the public stick picks. Ah. Are you two friends? Dick Pills. Uh, listen, Dick Pills. Listen, man, C- could you. Pills. Stand over. Picks. <clears throat> Pills. Listen, man, could you make. Picks. Dick Pedick 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 Don't think of censorship as intrinsically good or bad in this case. It's just necessary. Big tech is doing it a ton in ways that even free speech warriors don't even realize they're okay with. So to say that censorship only applies when right-wing figures are banned from Twitter completely misses the point. But Streeter, Streeter, time out, time out. You're defining censorship so loosely, you render the term meaningless. We're not talking about spam, we're talking about censoring opinions and ideas. Uh, it, It goes back to the idea that you should be able to challenge ideas and certainly wrong ideas well first of all where do you draw the line between ideas and the other stuff i mean why can't i share my ideas on how to last longer in bed using one simple trick okay joking aside i know where this line of argumentation is going so let's talk about the first amendment an idea is a thought in someone's mind Ideas! Ideas! A 2021 Cato Institute national survey showed that of the Republican respondents, 81% felt that Trump's Twitter ban violated the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Now right out of the gate, we have a fundamental misunderstanding of how this all works. Just to clarify, most law scholars agree that all this big tech free speech stuff is not a First Amendment issue. The words of the first start with the phrase, Congress shall make no law, meaning that the government may not directly restrict the practice of speech, whereas private, non-governmental actors, such as corporations, for the most part, can pretty much restrict speech as they please in private spaces. This is not necessarily a good thing, as large platforms should not be absolved of their responsibility to the principles of free speech, But as a matter of constitutional rights, no one is necessarily breaking the law here. There's another angle here, though. While the First Amendment does not legally bind platforms, people argue that platforms should nonetheless mimic as much as they can the First Amendment as a content moderation standard. To many, including Papa Bear, legality should ultimately set the bar. That way, matters of opinion and ideas will have free reign on platforms as lawful speech. It's important that people have the, both the, uh, the reality and the perception uh, that they are able to speak freely within the bounds of the law. In my view, uh, Twitter should um, match the laws of the, of the country. Obviously, uh, Twitter or any forum is bound by the laws of the country that it operates in. Examples of speech protected under the Constitution include pornography, recommendations to drink bleach, vulgarity and racial slurs, and Holocaust denial. Funny thing though, going back to that Cato study, a fair number of Republican respondents, you know, those who favor a First Amendment style system, would actually opt to remove or ban that content. I mean, damn, which is it? And did anyone consider how this argument works in cases outside the US? In the case of Russia, Ukraine, the tech companies did not adhere to Elon's principle, defying a number of censorship requests from the Russian government over its handling of the war. At this point, it's rather pointless to insist the law and the constitution can somehow solve all of our moderation problems. They can't. I'm sorry, I wish it were that simple. But tech companies have poured billions of painstaking dollars to solve it. And it is very unlikely that Elon Musk, a man with absolutely no experience in content moderation, somehow solved it overnight. Chapter two. At this point, you'll hopefully agree that there is no such thing as an unmoderated platform. But you can't blame the internet for trying though. Let's go on a tour. Log on to the subreddit, r free speech and your attention goes immediately to the rules section. Now I'm guessing the intent here wasn't to create a quote, free speech zone. Rather, it's just a 
topical discussion on free speech, but come on. <laughs> you can't help but see the irony in the moderator threatening to ban everyone who disagrees with him. <laughs> Anybody that expresses the belief that free speech can only be restricted by the government will be banned from the subreddit. You laugh. I know. But let's be charitable here and look at some other spaces online that were brave enough to put freedom first. Namely, the so-called alt-tech, or free speech alternatives created by right-leaning movement builders to compete against censorship-loving big tech. And sure, these alternatives might permit more content than average, but I'd like to turn your attention to a little something called Terms of Service! also often called community standards and guidelines, which, regardless of your platform, censor speech in some form or another. Click on any one of them and you'll see that most really don't permit pure, free expression. And it's most noticeable when it comes to sex and nudity. Gab, a blog and social networking service, doesn't allow, quote, obscenity. Pretty open-ended there, Gab. Nor does social media tool Getter, May I remind you that sex and nudity is not illegal to host on your platform. In fact, nudity in some cases is actually allowed on YouTube. The only platform that does seem to permit sexual content was Parler, who, realizing that porn on the internet has as much gravitational pull as a black hole, might be starting to regret they ever did. To be fair, the major complaints about big tech crackdown on ideas, ideas focuses on specific policies like hate speech, harassment, and misinformation. You know, the abstract stuff. Companies, I mean, Facebook, Twitter, Google. I, I, I would be willing to bet that a conservative running a social network would not have a hate speech policy. And oh, touche, my friends. On that, I give you rumble. Dave Rubin and joining me today is the CEO of Rumble. Rumble is a video platform, supposedly a free speech alternative to YouTube and an antidote to overly stringent policies on hate speech and harassment, often used by big tech to silence right-wing viewpoints. Let me get this straight, Chris. Our policy is that people can basically say what they want and we're not gonna decide who the winners or losers are. Can we be doing something so radical like that? We wanna tell people what they can or can't say. If you're having an argument at the dinner table, why can't you have that argument when you're online? If you're having a discussion or having an opinion, why can't that be online? This is the free and open internet. It's as free as your dinner table. Rumble is unique in that you won't find any mention of policies on racism, anti-Semitism, or hatred. What was that nondescript little bird? I apologize, I am told Rumble actually bans content or material that is grossly offensive like racism, anti-Semitism, and hatred. You know, ideas. ideas. Okay, let's turn to video hosting platform BitChute, whose community guidelines are considered more lax. And it shows. Within seconds, I'm already swimming in Nazi tribute content. Take a look at their policies, and you won't find anything that can be construed as cracking down on ideas. Uh... Oop, I'm told BitChute bans harmful activities, activities that are intended to lead to someone getting badly hurt or worse. Uh, they also prohibit dogpiling and brigading. I don't know, ideas? ideas? I mean, just look at the entire landscape of free speech alternatives. You'll find that their content moderation policies start to look pretty similar to the platforms they purport to hate. Ah, but I have not yet spoken about Truth Social, a social media platform started by Donald Trump and his new media company formed after his banishing from Twitter and Facebook. This tagline is, follow the truth. And really, this is not your everyday Twitter platform. Instead of posting a tweet, you post a truth. Instead of a retweet, you re-truth. And it's such a brilliantly original concept that they submitted them as trademarks. And it never gets to a point where repeated uses of the word truth start to sound defensive, ever. Where was I? Oh, if you're looking for a thriving, 
free speech ecosystem? Stay away from Truth Social. Their track record has been rough. From the outset, a user was banned for signing up with the username Devin Nunez Cow. Its initial policies came under fire for disallowing any criticism of their platform or the way it's run, not to mention excessive us of capital letters. Don't worry, Grandpa, it's not a shot against you. I'm sure they love your demographic. In summer of 2022, while US Congress were holding hearings about the January 6th insurrection, Truth Social reportedly had users banned for posting about the hearings. Well, I'll give them some credit at least. Their terms of service don't contain any hate speech policy language. So at least they're trying to be consistent. Spoke too soon. Your interactive content should not contain discriminatory references based on religion, race, gender, national... I, I, I would be willing to bet that a conservative running a social network would not have a hate speech policy. If true social is any bellwether for how successful these alt tech platforms will be, hmm, what's a good metaphor to describe it? Well, let's just say it's like a 4x4 flipped on its back. And it's not just Truth Social. All of these so-called alt-tech platforms seem to be hitting some rough patches despite an initial period of rapid growth. There's even alleged infighting where one alt-tech video platform, Odyssey, had accused its peer, Rumble, of manipulating their engagement data to deceive investors. Yeesh. Streeter. Okay, stop. Maybe alt tech isn't as free speech as it's cracked up to be. But what about thriving free speech spaces like 4chan? Ah, yes, the internet image board that once epitomized no hold bar free expression, which once so eloquently declared to the world 4chan regards freedom of speech as important. Of course, 4chan did bring you some proud free speech movements like hashtag Gamergate and the alt-right. Haha, <laughs> those were the days. Well, I'm going to need you to brace yourself because now they too have a long and convoluted laundry list of content policies. Woof, very important indeed. Well, hold on. Maybe its policies are about promoting diverse viewpoints by <clears throat> banning furry content? Really? Furries? Come on. Who did the furries ever hurt? Whatever happened to furdom of speech? Okay, okay. Four chans out. There has to be some unfettered free speech arena that exists somewhere on the internet. And indeed, this is where our free speech search ends. 8chan, now called 8kun, adheres so strictly to free expression it only disallows content deemed illegal. Very much up for interpretation. Oh, and spam. Content moderators also set more granular rules against things like doxing and will remove anything that they deem irrelevant to the subject at hand. But aside from that, it's safe to say it's one of the least censorious platforms out there. Congratulations! You just practiced your right to free. And that is exactly the problem. Because no one likes 8chan. The story of 8chan is a fascinating lesson in online free speech. It starts with the platform's founder, Fred Brennan, a software developer and former 4chan addict who first found solidarity with incels, shorthand for involuntarily celibate a community of disaffected and lonely young men who indulge in their hatred of women. Believing 4chan to have gone too soft, Fred went on to found 8chan and attract others like him who wanted a stronger free speech alternative. He then witnessed the hyper-radicalization happening within this so-called free speech atmosphere. White supremacists, conspiracy theorists, and others with extremely hostile worldviews would establish flourishing communities. It was 8chan where the shooter from Christchurch, New Zealand would post his 74-page manifesto, along with photos of his murder weapon decorated with various 8chan memes. Fred Brennan had cut ties with the site in 2016, having grown disgusted by these subcultures. His departure already had been in the making, 
having unexpectedly found authentic companionship with a woman, an incel no-no, and shedding his old beliefs of what he once thought were hard truths about women and the world. Today he spends his time trying to fight against the monster he had created. Two lessons emerge out of this story. Let's start with the obvious. That a pure, unfettered speech platform can be a breeding ground for radicalization. But the second lesson here is more interesting. That an anything goes mentality is counterintuitively not a pro-speech environment. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll let Fred say it himself in this interview with Vice. Let's use a word that they hate, diversity. It started extremely diverse. We had all of these people from all walks of life, all different socioeconomic classes being creative. But over time, it became disillusioned white men and everybody else left. And I think image boards create that kind of mentality because if you don't know the memes, you're an outsider. And if the memes are all Nazi memes, why are you going to want to post there? And here we come to the myth of neutrality. 8chan was ostensibly a neutral space, but how neutral can it be if only a special segment of disaffected white males on the platform are the only ones truly comfortable to express themselves? First off, it is hard for any platform to be neutral because value judgments are baked into its content policies. Even the policies that I mentioned before can be enforced in some biased way. More importantly, platforms are neutral to the extent that society is neutral. And sometimes society isn't that way at all. Law scholar Marianne Franks argues that the word platform is, quote, impressively obfuscating. The word platform evokes neutrality, objectivity, and passivity. It suggests that if there is prejudice, inequality, or violence on the platform, it's not the fault or the responsibility of the platform which merely offers a space for people to do as they will. In spaces where intimidation and abuse of vulnerable groups is rampant, a laissez-faire approach only reinforces status quo inequalities in free expression and civic participation. Why wouldn't society's status quo dynamics reproduce itself online? Spoiler, it does. Case in point, algorithms. A seemingly neutral concept, they're like math. And come on, how can math be racist? Scholar Safia Noble in her study of Google search argues that math can indeed be racist. More than a decade ago, platforms were generally less moderated compared to the present. So search terms like gorillas would return images of black people. N-word house led to the geolocation of the White House on maps during the Obama administration. If Google search was supposed to be a neutral lens into the world, then why do ugly societal sentiments get codified into the user experience so easily? More and more, platforms are learning that there needs to be better curation if you're actually to strive toward a more neutral ideal. Therefore, they use moderation or censorship to ensure it is a comfortable space for free expression by the widest range of audiences, and that the fewest number of people feel alienated and excluded, especially by content that appears to be harassing or misinforming them. I'd like to clarify here, platforms are not necessarily doing this out of the goodness of their own hearts. You need not forget, this type of work is quite profitable as well. So if you want to ensure the largest user base, you have every incentive to be the exact opposite of a free speech absolutist space like HN. And over the last decade or so, these curation principles have now been adopted by the most important players in this story. Big Tech. Chapter 4. I think this is a good time to disclose that I have recently accepted a job with Big Tech, but I'm just going to ask you to trust me that I'm not shilling for industry here. It's a long story. I didn't think I'd be working for them, but here I am. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Before we get into the political, how did big tech become big tech? Let's go back to the 90s. Killer tofu! 
Now, you make sure Dasha and Peter show you how they've done some of their school reports and not all that cybernet stuff, okay? I don't know how old you are, viewer, but I'm old enough to have experienced the dial-up era and the thrill of filling my GeoCities page with so many tiny animated GIFs that it looked like an ant colony flipping its sh**. While I was playing with websites, adults far, far away were debating how the internet was going to be governed, if at all. It was at that time, technologist, former hippie, and Grateful Dead songwriter John Perry Barlow wrote the Declaration of Independence of cyberspace. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. I declare the global social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose on us. At the time, the internet was thought of as a refuge from government tyranny, a self-regulating utopia where people were finally free to be themselves. This ethos would influence the next few decades of internet culture. But what Barlow and his fellow cyber libertarians didn't expect was that while government was not going to necessarily be the overlords of the internet, massive corporations eventually would. Back then, internet companies were small startups, scrappy, done in garages. But later, they grew into behemoths, consolidated power, buying out their competitors, and big tech was born. Now, we have just a handful of companies who have effectively monopolized the rules of communication. Why did this happen? The most commonly understood reasons are network effects. Online users are less inclined to engage on fragmented platforms and tools and would rather interact with others on more commonly shared spaces. Two, money. money. Capitalism, baby. The collection of personal data and advertising became so goddamn profitable Consumers became the product. It's genius. Profits lead to consolidation. They scoop up their competitors, gain favorable regulation, and ensure that users of their platform have fewer and fewer places to run off to. But here I focus on a third, less understood reason. The spook factor. Let's see, how to explain. Ah, back to the story of Barlow. A few years before declaring independence, a group of hackers stole his credit card info and published it online. Barlow is quoted as saying, no one has, quote, put the spook in me quite as much as those hackers did. In a sense, he became a victim of his own ethos. If the internet was truly a haven for freedom, then to what extent are individuals free to exploit others? The 90s was the infancy of the internet, more experimental and optimistic, but it was only a matter of time for the exploitation machinery to mature enough, using Barlow's words, to put the spook in all of us. I once heard a metaphor that big tech paved the floor of the internet to make the ground you walk on feel more solid. Things are more convenient and optimized, but it also cultivated a sense of safety and predictability, like you were on a supervised playground, sheltered from the scary outside world. Browser security features ensure that you're less likely to stumble onto malicious sites. The App Store vets otherwise shady applications you download onto your iPhone. And then we come to revenge porn. You got a nude floating about the internet that you want taken down? Revenge porn in many jurisdictions is illegal, although not all. But even so, the law doesn't fully prevent your nude from continuing to circulate about. What to do? Unfortunately, at this junction in time, you don't have much choice but to put your faith in our big tech overlords, who govern the high traffic spaces in which your nude might travel. Well, why would they want to do this in the first place? Even under US law, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, platforms are largely not liable for your nudes being uploaded to their spaces. Yet, in exchange for your trust, 
and thus the continued ability to use your personal data for profit, they actually do take action. By being so goddamn rich, they're able to invest in some pretty sophisticated functions. AI and pixel recognition to find and eliminate that floating nude even if it is uploaded multiple times, and to make sure that you don't continue to feel spooked while going about your day on their platform. Now it is a less than perfect system. There's lots of ethical concerns around these protections too, but this is our reality. So in very subtle ways, we have ended up depending on big tech's protection in ways we don't even realize. Policing lots of different issues, all the issues which I mentioned earlier, the field of content moderation has now become a massive and more sophisticated profession than ever. Platforms, of course, make massive moderation blunders, and there's no reason to let down your skepticism of these companies, but they have at least done enough to prevent most of us from feeling so frustrated and alienated we quit these platforms en masse. You are watching my video via YouTube, after all. They've grown so large that people have now come to expect Big Take to take responsibility. A Pew Research poll showed that since 2018, majorities of Americans say tech companies have a responsibility to prevent misuse of their platforms, for example, to influence elections. It's even gotten to the point where people have been warned against treating them as representative government. So the right are correct when they've noticed that we are in a different era because now big tech has ventured into regulating the arguably more abstract elements of speech. Ideas. Like hate speech and misinformation. It's part of their business mandate to retain users. I mean, who wants to feel constantly harassed or being lied to at every turn? On the other hand, why should they be the arbiters of truth? And at what point are they silencing political viewpoints? And that is how we got to this debate. Our target for this year's purge is hiding in your home. Does big tech silence political viewpoints? My answer hovers between it's complicated and freaking no. I'll attempt to explain it here in much more detail by steel manning what I think are the most legitimate arguments and pieces of evidence from the right over bias and censorship and present them here. Note, Proving that political speech is being silenced in a deliberately partisan manner is really hard. The data we have to work off of is extremely unreliable because A, we're bombarded by highly spun stories shared by whoever gets struck or banned from a platform. And in almost all of these cases, important context is always omitted to play up a conspiracy narrative. And B, big tech generally has not done a good job at being fully transparent and consistent about their removal policies, or providing good enough appeals mechanisms when removals do happen. But that shall not deter us in our quest for a smoking gun. So smoking gun. My research journey starts with a literature review of right-leaning authors. I started with the book Speechless by right-wing pundit Michael Knowles, Picture it here with a Hollywood actor who refused to pose holding the book himself. To summarize, it was less an empirical case against big tech and more of a philosophical treatise against wokeness. Knowles made sure to describe the January 6th insurrection as a small number of Trump rally attendees who broke away from a peaceful gathering and conducted less a coup d'etat than a Cri de coeur, a directionless mob rather than an insurrection. <laughs> for someone who has contempt for ivory tower leftists, especially those who needlessly dress up their language with terms like cri de coeur, Knowles doesn't hide his praise for socialist thinkers like Antonio Gramsci and George Orwell because he thinks their work somehow helps him condemn political correctness. He does, though, make an empirical argument against big tech when highlighting Donald Trump's Twitter ban. But the best data he can cite was an NYT article about Twitter, quote, deplatforming tens of thousands of right-wingers, his words. Touche! 
and upon looking at his source, it was an NYT article over Twitter cracking down on QAnon accounts, not necessarily right-wingers. At which point I ask, does he consider QAnon the name of a popular and dangerous conspiracy theory like in his camp? And even if he's willing to own them, Twitter reportedly cracked down on them because they proliferate harmful falsehoods about pedophilia that have driven people to violence, and because many of the accounts banned were spam accounts, not because they were right-leaning. At some point I realized reading Knowles did not nuance any of my understanding on free speech. In fact, it was the intellectual equivalent of rubbing sandpaper in my eyes. So naturally I wanted to keep going. So I picked up U.S. Senator Josh Hawley's book aptly titled The Tyranny of Big Tech, in which he delivers a stark warning about the tyranny of big tech. Hawley dedicates several pages to an anonymous Facebook whistleblower under the pseudonym Mike Gilgan. Unfortunately, the revelations were less than damning, containing only anecdotal suspicions about areas of the company Gilgan wasn't directly involved in. You know, being one of 70,000 employees in the company. Instead, it was all frustrations about supposed double standards in an annoyingly left-leaning internal work culture. But Holly did cite some research, though. You have my attention now, Senator. A study by psychologist Robert Epstein, documenting what he called the search engine manipulation effect claiming that Google search results in the 2016 presidential election were demonstrably favorable towards Democrats, swaying undecided voters, 2.6 million of them, he claims, to vote for Hillary Clinton. Smoking gun. But the study has been panned by other researchers, among them social media scholar Francesca Tripodi, who had serious concerns over Epstein's methods of using a handful of psychological experiments without any involvement of data scientists or political scientists to make a leap toward concluding search engine manipulation. Basically, a grand conspiracy that would otherwise rock the foundations of big tech. Despite Epstein loudly declaring himself neutral in this matter as a voting Democrat, it was hard not to be a bit puzzled by his zeal. Two other major studies contradict his narrative, one from Stanford, conducted by actual information scientists who audited 4 million URLs scraped from Google search, found no inherent bias in search results. Also, a separate study conducted by The Economist found similar results. Now, as scientists, you can't rule out Epstein's claim, but it's safe to say, no smoking gun. Much of the information I'm citing here, by the way, comes from a report from NYU, which summarizes how and why there's little to no data of real targeted right-wing suppression. What about the bans, the bans, the bans? At this point, I didn't think I would get much more from right-wing literature on big tech bias. So my journey continues to examine direct claims from right-wing figures that say they were banned or suspended for harboring right-wing opinions. Ever hear of right-wing pundit Dan Bongino? who in 2020 was banned from YouTube, in his words, for simply quoting national advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci. They censored me for a comment Dr. Anthony Fauci had made about masks that I repeated later. You could say he was simply asking <laughs> questions, <laughs> the common lazy excuse for challenging consensus. But hey, I'm just a normal kid like you, except that I ask questions. And because I'm brave enough to ask questions, I come under scrutinies. Is Wendy using your lunch money to buy heroin? But the logical conclusion he made was objectively false information that could lead to physical harm. Even before the pandemic era, platforms have had little tolerance for medical misinformation. You know, to make sure, for example, quack salespeople don't convince you to avoid the hospital if you have cancer because crystals? Or that drinking bleach cures disease. Back to that, I guess. And for his sins, YouTube gave Bongino the Bangino. <laughs> the bird came back, and I learned that in truth, it was just a warning by temporary suspension, and that he could have gotten his account reinstated if he didn't subvert the suspension by posting under a different account. 
which triggered a permanent ban. Can I say Bangino now? Ah, that's better. Bangino clarified that he had been planning on leaving the censorship-loving YouTube for a long time and welcomed the ban. You know, kind of like an attempt to win the breakup. Bongino's case demonstrates a very common spin maneuver of what I call persecution anecdotes. The steps are the same. A right-wing pundit gets a warning or a strike for a piece of content they frame as extremely innocuous. I never dox Sandy Hook families. I've been apologizing for years. And then accuse the platforms of silencing them when there's more likely more than several contextual factors that put them in clear violations of terms of service. Here's what we have. We have a high-tech lynch mob invo involved in really cyber warfare and, and stalking warfare, trying to have him removed off the web, right? Most recently, right-wing thought leader Jordan Peterson broke Twitter's harassment policy on willfully deadnaming transgender individuals. A few days ago, I penned an irritated tweet in response to one of the latest happenings on the increasingly heated culture war front in response to the decision of an actress, actor named Ellen Elliot Page. This was after he announced quitting the platform, only to come back to insult the transgender actor Elliot Page as the first thing he did, suggesting that gender-affirming surgeries should be criminal, which they're not. His account could have been reinstated by deleting the offending tweet, but in the act of free speech martyrdom, he decided not to bend the knee. I should at least know exactly what I did wrong if I am required to acknowledge that my tweet violated the Twitter rules. What rules, you sons of bitches? He broadcast his unjust treatment to the rest of the world by trying to imitate a cartoon villain as much as he could. And I'm not taking down that tweet or acknowledging that my tweet violated the Twitter rule. Up yours, woke moralists. We'll see who cancels who. Again, Twitter was enforcing its community guidelines it had already established back in 2018. Critics may point out that other users with similar behaviors were not banned, but that relies on a lot of assumptions. It's unclear if other accounts have had a history of bullying people based on gender identity or have had as powerful a following one that's likely to mobilize a harassment campaign as much as some of these right-wing influencers. I'll admit, the conditions are less than clear-cut, but knowing what we know, the strike against Jordan Peterson seems more like a normal platform policy maneuver than an ideological move to silence free speech. Finally, let's talk about the most high-profile ban, Donald Trump. His came only after the storming of the Capitol on January 6th, the one from Twitter for glorification of violence, a platform policy established more than a year prior. Reminder again that many of the right-wing alt-tech platforms have similar policies on incitement to violence. And his statements calling for violence didn't start with January 6th. There had been a whole history of inflammatory statements that could very well have broken platform policies that were not actioned upon, likely because his communications as sitting president were deemed too important to censor from the public. In fact, Donald Trump's sustained presence on any platform was a testament to how platforms actually favor right-wing content. If you hadn't heard before, the most active pages on Facebook are right-wing content. Again, tech companies would be stupid to alienate these audiences completely, and hence, they're quite methodical in appearing unbiased. In fact, internal memos leaked where senior executives relaxed misinformation policies on conservative publications like Breitbart and PragerU and pundits like Charlie Kirk. And if you think it's just right-wing viewpoints that are censored, left-wing viewpoints probably are as well. Writer and activist Jillian York pointed out the phenomenon of, quote, companies being more adept at serving governments than its own users. Summarizing how Facebook had a streak of removals from Palestinian activists critical of the state of Israel. She makes the case that big tech, regardless of their political leanings, are just way too simpatico with authoritarian governments out of a desire to continue doing business in their territory. 
The process of removal and bans isn't just a question of left and right. It's a complex interplay of power, incentives, and ethics. Tech companies certainly have less than a consistent track record of enforcement, but to this day, it's still really tough to prove that it's due to any left-wing bias. It is safer to say their behavior is far more capitalist than it is leftist. After all, it's not in their business interest to alienate users by quashing all right-wing opinions and outlets on their platforms, nor do they want a PR nightmare of allowing destructively racist shit to overpower their platform either. What you are seeing are attempts to satisfy as many users as possible and thus keep the clicks flowing. What about the leaks, the leaks, the leaks? My search goes on. Here, I focus on leaked evidence, which highlight another line of criticism, that big tech's internal culture is too left-wing and therefore unfit to govern its spaces impartially. More recently, right-wing activist group Project Veritas released investigative, and I'm saying this in air quotes, videos of tech employees bearing all while being unsuspectingly recorded. Of course, Project Veritas has a reputation as a bad faith actor accused of deceptive disinformation practices and, in this case, luring tech company employees via dating apps and secretly taping their conversations. I won't go into why I advise deep skepticism of Project Veritas, but if you really want to dig in, I can't more highly recommend a video series by YouTuber Timba on Toast which, by the way, does not nearly have enough views. Grainy camera footage certainly gives the impression of scandal, but in the end, it's a bit of a nothing burger. Little is known about this actual Twitter employee, and the video, while legitimate, doesn't dish any hard evidence of suppression beyond rambling complaints about working with too many commies and his praise for Papa Brr. It is actually no secret that tech employees lean to the left. That's a quality true for many companies, in fact, which tend to be based in cities. Cities are where highly educated professionals tend to concentrate. Highly educated professionals tend to skew liberal. This is furthered by the fact that big tech is based in Silicon Valley, Northern California. You know, dangerously close to San Francisco. Now, most independent Americans don't want San Francisco values. Tech CEOs admit themselves that their staff is more left-leaning. We don't ask our employees, but my guess is that many employees at tech companies are probably liberal. I, it's really fascinating. I would put a caveat on that, though. Silicon Valley has birthed many powerful conservatives and libertarians like Carly Fiorina, Meg Whitman, Peter Thiel, Mark Andreessen, oh yeah, and... Come and get Papa Bear! It's also worth mentioning that Facebook's vice president of global public policy, Joel Kaplan, is a Republican who has been repeatedly suspected of pressuring the company to favor right-wing viewpoints, who supported Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court, showing up for him during his sexual assault hearing. Yes, we drank beer, boys and girls still like beer. And who threw a party for him afterward. But let's assume big tech is super leftist. The question then remains, does ideology translate into policy and practice? Perhaps the closest thing that came to a smoking gun was a 2016 Facebook leak to Gizmodo from employees who worked on their trending news topics, where allegedly right-wing publishers were deliberately excluded from being listed. It is important to note that the same Gizmodo article also featured testimony from other employees who outright disputed the claims. Further, an official internal investigation, which had to be submitted to the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee, found no evidence of partisan bias, even though Facebook did scuttle the Trending Topics team and the feature altogether. We should also note that a trending widget is but a small component of the user experience, and sometimes it requires actually quite a lot of curation. Automated topic functions left unchecked sometimes Love Nazis. It was made up. Does this leak represent a smoking gun? No. Unverified at best. One last set of leaks comes from Google. 
where senior leaders address the entire company after the election of Donald Trump in a rather somber tone, consoling employees who felt worried about what a Donald Trump presidency could mean. Let's face it, most uh, people here are uh, pretty upset and pretty sad for uh, because of the election. Another leak was posted by right-wing news outfit The Daily Caller of an internal discussion among Google senior leaders about news quality and misinformation, where someone shared a vague but supposedly damning phrase, let's make sure we reverse things in four years, suggesting that they wanted to reverse the election of Donald Trump. But wait, that was it? But let me use this example to give you my hot take. You don't have to be leftist to find right-wing content super problematic. Let's re-examine the leak situation. According to the article, the reverse things in four years comment was said in the midst of a debate on information integrity, not necessarily how to conquer the right. (laughs) But which is which? Is there a relationship? It shouldn't be at all controversial to say that the information ecosystem leading to Trump's election was objectively unhealthy. And I'm not basing this off of feels. There are several studies to back this up. One from the Oxford Internet Institute showing that right-wing accounts on Twitter and Facebook ahead of the 2018 midterms were far more susceptible to sharing content classified as junk news. The methods define junk news as content originating from sources lacking any journalistic scruples, such as verifying sources, publishing names of authors and editors, issuing corrections, all the while counterfeiting aesthetics of real news organizations. Furthermore, scholars from Harvard, Northeastern, and Buffalo studied 16,000 Twitter accounts in 2019, finding that fewer than 5% of accounts on the left or center ever shared fake news, while 11% of accounts identified as right, and 21% of extreme right accounts did, concluding right-wingers do indeed spread more fake news. But the most comprehensive examinations I've come across of media systems comparing left and right comes from Bankler, Ferris, and Roberts in Network Propaganda, which focuses on the right-wing media ecosystem and how it uniquely operates on its own set of norms, unmoored from familiar standards of journalistic objectivity and thus susceptible to more disinformation, half-truths, and frankly, lies. Their data indicates the centrality of, quote, extreme sites, Breitbart, Infowars, Truth Feed, Zero Hedge, and The Gateway Pundit, who don't claim at all to adhere to information quality standards and in effect, keep the discourse extreme core news organizations on the right-wing sphere, like The Daily Caller and Fox News, who do claim some journalistic rigor, were shown to simply be conduits for narratives pushed by the extreme sides, rather than putting on what they call the truth-telling breaks. The result? Well, a majority of Republicans now believe in outright falsehoods, like the Pizzagate conspiracy, AKA the belief that secret cabals of Democrats were raping children. It had one man so convinced that he attacked a Washington DC pizzeria with an assault weapon. Spoiler, the gunman found nothing. The study of course doesn't let left-wing media ecosystems off the hook. To be fair, the analysis downplays the role of Cambridge Analytica, Russian social media manipulation, and online white supremacist communities as limited players in information disorder a popular mainstream media narrative. Sources identified as left-wing also produce their own extreme falsehoods, such as the Donald Trump rape story. However, they also notice that those falsehoods don't tend to flourish in the same way because standards of objectivity tend to get in the way, since its ecosystem is more closely bound with verification principles like fact-checking and other common objectivity checks found in media. And here we arrive at a crux. If hate speech and misinformation are disproportionately more represented in right-wing media, then any measure to address these problems will look like disproportionately silencing dissent, 
even if you're looking at it purely from a lens of information quality. Facebook's been taking this kind of stuff down that entire time, and now all of a sudden it's an issue. Why is that happening, okay? And you hear conservative bias, but it's actually not conservative bias. They've been taking down that same type of hate speech since 2008, 2009, and there's just more of that type of hate speech. If you're a right-wing influencer, this is the perfect tactic for media manipulation. They're disingenuous when they dismiss <laughs> defenders of Merry Christmas as fabricating some, quote, war on Christmas. Of course it's a war on Christmas. Or more precisely, a war on the religious nature of America. Now, everyone is paranoid that even the most objectively innocuous thing are part of some politically partisan game or a chess piece in a culture war. Vaccines don't need to be political, but vaccine denial has made it that way. Voting rights don't need to be political, but manufactured voter fraud claims have made it that way. This is made worse by a both sides this media landscape, where issues need to be framed as a balance between opposing viewpoints despite the evidence. Most people would agree that Pizzagate is harmful misinformation that can get extremely out of hand if left unaddressed. However, the conspiracy can now be shielded, having now been imbued with political qualities since QAnon falls squarely in the pro-Trump camp. And any attempt to act on that will inevitably look like an affront to right-wing ideas. Let me pause for a second and clarify that it is not my intention to frame right-wing ideas or right-leaning people as being inferior. This is simply to point out flaws in the very systems that have captured their attention. These flaws could easily exist under any ideology, but for now, it should be clear who is responsible at this time for poisoning the well of information. According to Google, its algorithm ranks pages along a number of dimensions. One important dimension is relevance. The company admits that there was a time when relevance was overfavored, and so when you are seeking out, say, historical information about the Holocaust, you would get served a wave of white supremacist and Holocaust denial content. The most users weren't searching for that. Denialist content had a high relevancy score as it was associated with more activity, engagement, and general popularity. They claimed to have course corrected, not by manually hunting down conspiratorial content and eliminating it, but instead, at a systemic level, tweaked the algorithm to bring more authoritativeness to its rankings. To make sure, if you're dished information on the Holocaust, that they come from more vetted, reputable sources. This blemish on Google's history teaches us a fundamentally important lesson. Just because it's popular, doesn't mean it's valuable. Communications scholar Dana Boyd once said, we live in a world now where we equate free speech with the right to be amplified. Does everyone have the right to be amplified? Remember when we established at the beginning, in order for speech to be speech, you need an audience? Well, I guess that begs the question, what entitles you to that audience? Now, I'm sure many creators feel that they have put in the necessary time and effort to get more followers, subscribers, views, likes, and beat out their peers in the marketplace of ideas. They thus have earned the right to be amplified, the right for their ideas to have broader reach. Getting banned must then feel egregiously cruel as if your First Amendment rights are being taken from you. But, like the Holocaust deniers, maybe the ability to be amplified should never have been yours in the first place. Also remember when we talked about the definition of spam, low quality information that is boosted through manufactured or deceptive tactics? Think about it for a second. Low quality, meaning stuff that is irrelevant to the subject at hand or related but ultimately not what you wanted. Manufactured because it is often artificially produced or deceptive because it often comes as a result of human or algorithmic manipulation to get more traction than it deserves. Starting to sound familiar? They've got, in one shot, leaves blowing and flowers that are out and you see the leaves blowing and they go, 
they glitch. They're recycling a, a green screen behind them. Now, it's important to recognize that the boundary between spam and legitimate content is not clear cut. Rather, it's a spectrum. Somewhere in the middle is clickbait, for example. But the closer it exists to the spam side of the spectrum, the greater advantage it has toward moving up the rankings, being favored by algorithms, receiving engagement, and so forth. And this is where right-wing content comes into the picture. We've established that the right-wing thought ecosystem is rife with highly sensational, false, or misleading information. Satanic rituals and sex magic being performed at colleges and universities all across the United States and Canada. It is the type of content that is optimized for emotions. The information may not be outright false, but it can make some crazy omissions or be heavily exaggerated for the purposes of making you feel outraged or repressed by forces beyond your control. The streets of Puka are lined with corpses, corpses of Ukrainian civilians. This is true. Now the question is, who did it? Joe Biden wins, they'll take over all our cultural institutions, they'll put psychotic and insane definitions in our dictionary, and they will take over, they'll never stop coming. They will take your job away, they will come for your parents. You will, you will do something wrong, they'll fire your mom. And if you're being called out as a content creator for spamming your way to the top, are your free speech rights actually being threatened? I'm sorry, I should just put it more bluntly. Right-wing content is spam. I'm not saying that right-wing ideas are spam. I'm saying that right-wing content as it exists in this era is spam. Now let me be clear, there's nothing wrong with allowing this type of content on its own. It certainly exists in all areas of the political spectrum. And frankly, it would be impossible to eliminate in a fair and consistent way. However, the problem is that it proliferates faster than legitimate information. They say a lie travels halfway around the world while the truth is still putting its pants on. We know that both spam and right-wing media is better optimized for attention ahead of truth. As a result, right-wing content has become unimaginably popular. And so, what the hell are we going to do about it? You may not ultimately trust big tech, and again, I don't blame you. Blue Ridge Mountain, Shenandoah. You don't have to agree with the way platforms have been cracking down on spam and misinformation. But like it or not, the future of information integrity will need to rely on safeguards. This does not mean big tech needs to be fact checkers or arbiters of truth. But someone or something will need to play curator so that platforms, at the very least, don't indulge in spammy tactics. If this can be done effectively, transparently, and accountably by corporation, government, or some combination of both, I say whatever, more power to them. Another hot take. Remember when I said at the beginning, free speech isn't about the speech, it's about the principles? I hope by now I've convinced you that deception really frustrates our ability to realize these principles, and that the future of true free speech depends on how well we can manage that deception. At the time of making this video, Elon Musk is currently trying to pull out of purchasing Twitter, accusing the company of understating the amount of bots and fake accounts. One can only speculate his real motivations. I'm going to guess that it's because he realized free speech is a touch more complicated than his tweets suggested. I'll give him this. He knows a lot about cars, rockets, and artificial intelligence. Thank you. <laughs> but he probably realized that he was in over his head, knowing next to nothing about law, human rights, and the field of content moderation. <laughs> like. When the CEO of Twitter posted a thread explaining misconceptions about spam and bots, he realized that the only serious rebuttal he was able to come up with was an emoji. I guess. He also realized that content moderation is a lot harder than it looks, a fragile science to strike the right balance between free speech and protecting users or to just plain not let your platform break the law and get sued to oblivion. 
Every single free speech solution he had in his head was probably thought of before by some other person, and rendered ultimately infeasible. That's why I say this story will go down in the history books as one of supreme hubris, where one obscenely wealthy man came after big tech, trying to purge it of its alleged leftist bias, and to do so using one simple trick.